I'm going to make a very quick, bold statement. And I, I already talked about this, but by the end of this workshop, my only goal is to make sure that each of you in here, whether you're live or you watch the recording, know how to land a high paying job offer in today's crazy market without spending countless hours applying. And most of the time, if you follow the steps that I teach here, you will be able to do that in less than 90 days. Most of our clients do it in less than 71 days. That's the average, 71.3 or something like that. This is going to be a lot. I'm going to cover strategies that work in almost any profession in tech. Product managers, customer success, digital media, solutions engineers, program managers, all the way from principal level, all the way to C-suite. How do I know this? Because these are the only types of clients we've helped. As of literally yesterday, we have 813 clients that have went through our program successfully, and they've landed th these types of jobs. Marketing, you name it, growth marketing, performance marketing, customer success, program management, change management, product management, nothing that I'm teaching you is based on theory. Everything I am teaching you today is based on experience. When you have experience, it no longer becomes opinion. And everything that I'm going to teach you too, I've used not just for our clients, but for myself as well. A man with experience is never at the mercy with a man who has an opinion. And so everything we're talking about is from experience. And someone mentioned it in here, and that's why I asked. The question is, yeah, these things are salesy. There's always a sales pitch at the end. So the question usually becomes, is Gaurav going to fucking sell us something? And the answer is no. Because I've been doing this for seven years. I've had so many of these workshops. Thousands and thousands of people have joined them. And never once have I sold anything. In instead, I actually give so much away for free guides, templates, whatever. And if you don't know, this is my business partner, Katie, who's also a coach in our program, who uh, someone was referring to. Katie and I have a very strong belief. And that belief is we don't want to try to squeeze every last drop out of the lemon, meaning I don't want to try to sell you something every single time I'm talking to you. Because those last drops are usually super duper sour. We know that. Um, let me just let all these people in. Okay. So the answer is you will not be sold a single thing. And instead I'm going to give away two things by the end of this. So the first thing I'm giving away is one seat in our coaching program. Miriam's part of our coaching program. You just heard it from her. This thing offers lifetime access we do, I mean, we, we cover everything. Every single nuance that is experienced in the job search process, we coach you through it every single day too. You'll have, un, we prep you for every single interview going. We write your resumes for you. We write your LinkedIn for you. We help you map out not just how to get your next job, but even what comes after that. We teach you how to get in front of hiring managers. We teach you how to prepare for these interviews. We even... Listen to some of your interviews so that way we can help you after the interview is done and, and tell you what you did right, what you didn't. Again, you'll get access to every single thing that's in our program. So I'm giving one seat away today completely for free. How do you win it? If there's something in here that you find helpful, which I know you will, at least one thing, I want you to take a picture of that slide and I want you to share it on LinkedIn and then just tag me. Okay, so this is how you win a free seat. Go on LinkedIn, post something that you found helpful in this workshop and just tag me. The second thing we're giving away once you get the recording of this webinar is our new book. It's called The Feel Good Career. And in this, you will have every single thing that we teach in our coaching program. 
templates, resources, guides. I mean, it is packed. We spent like the last five and a half months working on this. You will get this for free. In fact, nobody's going to ever pay for this. We're not going to sell this. We're just going to give it away for free. So you guys who are on here will get this. Okay. Just a little bit about me for those of you who are new. I've been in tech forever and a day. Um, I started off my career as a recruiter. Uh, this was back in 2006. Actually, I didn't start off my career as a recruiter. I started off selling yellow page ads <laughs> right after college. And it, for those of you who know anything about yellow page ads, I mean, it is not an easy grind. I was doing this when the internet was around. I'm not that mm -hmm. old. And imagine going into businesses, trying to sell them advertising space on yellow pages. And they're like, wait, but the internet's here. Why would we ever <laughs> post on yellow pages? That's what I did. Uh, eventually, I ended up starting a staffing agency, which grew to 72 million. We sold it to a management consulting firm in 2016 for 11.3 million. Um, and then I went on to, to start Career Sprout. I also became an executive at Overstock. Um, and since Career Sprout has started, we've helped again as of yesterday, I think 813 professionals. And none of this I was able to achieve because I came from some very privileged background. My parents are immigrants. You know, we when we moved to the States, my dad had a ninth grade education, started a business, couldn't make more than a few hundred bucks a month. Um, my mom worked two jobs. When I, you know, I ultimately went to college and I was very fortunate for that. And I didn't go to one of the best universities. I didn't go to Harvard. I didn't go to Yale. I didn't go to Stanford. I went to Cal State Fullerton, small state school. Um, it was a good school, but it wasn't like I was super connected after that. And so everything that I was able to achieve came from the systems that you're going to see today. And that's how our clients were able to achieve their results as well. These are just a few of the, the clients that we've helped throughout the years, along with what they've been able, able to do. Um, some of these came from this year. Some of these came from the last 12 months. People have got you jobs at Apple, Netflix, you name it. Okay, Amazon and startups. Here's the past six months. Just a few of their clients, product leaders, program management, customer success, solutions engineers, marketing, intel customer intelligence. One of our favorite stories from last year was someone who got a job at Google after spending eight years of her career. And I can show your <clears> LinkedIn <throat> profile, never making more than 53,000. We helped her get a job at, at Google and she increased her pay by a hundred. So how do we do this? Well, first it requires a strategy. You have to learn these strategies if you want to change your life and your career. There's no like ifs, ands, or buts around that. Everyone knows what most people do on LinkedIn. They sit there and apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs and it never works. They fail because they have, they don't have a strategy. But if you have a strategy and you know what you're doing, and if you're doing it the right way, then it won't take a lot of time. And again, most of the, our clients achieve their success in less than 71 days. But knowing what to do is the hardest part. And that feeling is, is tough. It's what creates hopelessness, right? When you don't know what to do, that's what creates hopelessness. So my goal today is to teach you everything that you need to know to accomplish your career goals, which will then make the hardest part easier which is why I also want you to stay till the end because we're gonna cover a lot today, a lot. We're gonna start with mindset because nothing matters if you, it, it's like anytime you start a new endeavor and if you don't have the right mindset, it just doesn't work because you're already starting off with some sort of disbelief. I'm not gonna spend too much time on mindset, but from there, I'll go to your, the actual strategy and then from there, I'm going to teach you how to execute that actual strategy. So let's start with mindset. What is mindset? End of the day, we already know what it is. It's a set of beliefs around what you believe is possible in your life. So then what's the key to being able to achieve the things you want to achieve? It's having a growth mindset versus fixed. A growth mindset 
is the foundation of achieving, knowing that you can achieve something that you haven't achieved before. A lot of people will come to us and say, I haven't been able to do this, so I just can't. That's a fixed mindset. I haven't been able to do it, so I can't. A growth mindset is, I haven't been able to do it yet. I just need to learn how. And every single person in this room, in this virtual room, each of you have already achieved something that at one point in your life, you didn't think you could. So there's no reason to believe that you can't. And we use a very simple technique called the belief equation. It's a very powerful yet very simplistic sort of theory, which, is, which states that what you choose to believe directly impacts the actions that you take, which then directly impact the results that you get, which then reinforces your original beliefs. Think about this like if we were to talk about a diet, and I've done this before. I've had people say, hey, you need to get on this workout plan and get on this diet. Could be my wife. And I've never done diets before. So think about any of any time you started something that you didn't really believe you could do. So when I started a diet before, I was like, well, I'm not really probably going to stick with this. Most diets don't work. I hear blah, blah, blah. So then the actions I took were very half-assed. I did start the diet. But then within two weeks, I started eating pizza. I started eating French fries. I started eating cheesecakes, burritos. And now, like, I was already off. So I was having half ass actions. So what do you think happened as a result of that? I clearly didn't see the results. And because I did not see the results, what did I tell myself? I knew I wasn't really capable of achieving this. I knew diets are a hoax. So half ass belief leads to half ass actions. And half-ass actions lead to half-ass results, which then reinforce your original belief of the thing. And why do most of us, myself included, my parents, people in this room, why is it that we why is it that we struggle with mindset? Well, it's not easy because we're fighting decades of entrenched beliefs. Decades of it, right? Most of our mindsets were always built by accident. How we create our mindset, it occurs slowly over time, right? Experiences such as if we were bullied as children, the education system, what we were taught in school, the social circle, who we surround ourselves with, what do they constantly talk about, what do they constantly think about, how you were raised, the information we consume. Man, like if you go on LinkedIn, if you go on LinkedIn, it's hard to ignore constant news about someone getting laid off, companies doing layoffs. So then what does that start reinforcing in our mind? Man, this is a tough job market. Everyone's getting laid off. I should just do whatever I can to get a job as quickly as I possibly can. Right? That's what we start to believe because of the information we consume. But how do we change it then? Well, we can't try to change it all at once, and it doesn't change overnight. But through the power of something called brain plasticity, you, have, you can start changing it slowly over time. And much of it requires everything that we just talked about. First of all, the belief, faith. Do we have it or not? If we don't have it, it's going to be really hard. You're fighting an uphill battle. What about inspiration? Finding new sources of it. Because for every person that's talking about layoffs, there's also someone else on LinkedIn daily talking about how they just landed an offer. So choosing to consume, you know, it's, it's kind of like if you eat, think about this, if you eat processed food every day, you eat junk food every day, you're going to get sick, right? That's a fact. I also believe that if you choose to consume negative information every single day, it's going to impact your mindset. Who do we surround ourselves with? That has a lot to do with how we think and how we feel and how we behave. So everything that impacts your mindset in the negative manner can also impact it in the positive. It's just how, how we choose to view it and, 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 and utilize it. But your mindset affects your outcome. 
which then affects your happiness. And it removes you as the obstacle. So the only thing I want you to take away from this is the, the only belief that actually matters is that you can grow and that you can always keep getting better. That's all that matters. Here's some mindset shifts you could make today if you wanted to, specific to the jobs, the job, the job market. And I remember this, you know, someone said, or a lot of you said on here that, um, you know, like you walk away with half-assed information or, or most of the workshops you've been on are not that helpful. And um, I'm trying to do everything in this workshop mm -hmm. to change that. If you apply everything you've learned, and there's a lot of it that you're going to learn, ask yourself, what's the worst case scenario by trying it? What's the worst case scenario today if you try what you learn on this workshop? The worst case scenario is that it doesn't work. In which case, you're right back to where you are today. And I, you know, when I started my business a long time ago, before I started it, actually, I was really scared. I had never come from money, as I told you. I had never made more than 46000 prior to starting my company, which ended up going to $72 million. And I was speaking to one of my mentors. And uh, at the time, I was a, 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 an agency recruiter. And I, I asked, uh, he asked me, he's like, well, what's the worst case scenario if you start this thing and it doesn't work? And I said, well, I guess I could always go back to being an agency recruiter. And so then he said, well, then what does it feel like? How does it feel to be living your worst case scenario? That was all I needed. So we're already living the worst case scenario and it's not even that bad. But what happens if you try it and it works? Way better job, way better career path much more money, happiness, fulfillment. There's infinite upside, very little downside. So I'm asking you to try what you learned today from start to finish. And I always believe, and I tell this to my clients, and you've seen the results for those of you who followed us for years and some you just saw, you're always one job offer away from changing the entire trajectory of your career. So in, ignore the doubt. Because if you try this and it works, your future self will completely thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go into the strategy. Real quick, are you guys ready for it now? Was that helpful? If there was any fluff to my workshop, that is the fluff, okay? The rest is all now tactical strategy. So I want to first and foremost just say thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to... We're gonna, cover a lot. Just wanted to see your faces. Okay. So the disclaimer is you need to follow the steps I teach you in order. Otherwise it won't work. It's kind of like, a. this was many, many, many years ago. Uh, I hired a, a fitness trainer and uh, he, before we started the workout program, he, he was like, um, Oh, Miriam, you know him. His name is Ronnie. And, um, he said, all right, here's the workout plan, here's the diet, and here's your recovery plan. He broke it down. And then every single Monday, I would have to meet with him in the morning. And he would say, ask me over the weekend, what did you eat? And so there was one, one Monday, I, I, I went in there and I said, well, I had like a few pieces of cheesecake and, and I think I had pizza. And he flipped out on me. And he's like, why would you do that? Oh my God, you're going to ruin your macronutrient plan and yada, yada, yada. And I don't know what words he was using, but he, he was really pissed. And he's like, dude, I, I'm giving you the entire playbook and you're not following it in order. You're not going to see the results. And it's the same with this. So as easy as it will feel to jump around once you've learned the full system, I would recommend that you don't. So stay away from the cheesecake. Don't get tempted to jump around. Just follow the steps in order, okay? So now think about, before I show you the system, think about what most people do, and maybe some of you on here have done yourselves. 
How do most people approach the job search? What has to happen before you start your job search? It's usually something negative. Lost my job, hate my boss, hate my company, not being promoted, I'm underpaid, I'm undervalued. You're, you, you're, it's like something really negative, right? So what do we, what do we do? The first reaction is, I'm going to slap together a resume. I'm going to talk about everything that I've done. And then I'm going to go out to the market and I'm going to apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Right? And then what happens? We hardly hear back. Crickets. So then we apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs again. And this time I'll tell a few of my friends and a few of my family members, hey, just so you know, I'm in the market again. And then maybe here and there you get an interview. And then what happens? You bomb that interview. It's okay, everyone bombs interviews. I've never met one person that hasn't. So then what do you do again? You go back and apply to hundreds and hundreds of jobs. You get another interview, bomb that interview. Hundreds and hundreds of jobs, get an interview. And at some point though, you get an inter you get an offer, right? Was it the offer you actually wanted? Probably not. But you take it because you have lack of options. Well, why are there lack of options? Because there was no strategy. It just started from a place of reaction. Everything that you had done was just a reactionary thing. Apply to job, put together a resume, yada, yada, yada. So what we're doing is we're going to flip this whole equation. The reason most people don't get into the jobs or build the careers that they actually want is because they never took the time to figure out where they actually wanted to go and then reverse engineer the path to get there. There is a science to this. Why right? we never take the time to figure out where do we want to go. We just actually start up to just think about what's next. What's next? How, how quickly can I get away from this negative situation only to find ourselves in another negative situation? So this is the strategy that we teach our clients. These are the five steps. And these are the five steps that we're going to walk you through today. Okay, so first and foremost, your resume, just, I'm sorry, your job search, just so you know, never starts with your resume. Let's make this, if you walk away with anything today, it's this. It never starts with your resume. It starts by first figuring out where do I want to be three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And then, like I said, reverse engineering the path to get there. Okay, so the way I, the example that I use is for everyone on here. Let's play a little game. Let's assume that all of you here live in Los Angeles, okay? And I say to each of you, I say, Susan, I want you to drive from LA to New York, but you cannot use any GPS device. You can't use a phone. You can't use a map. You can't have somebody in your car. You just have to figure it out. Well, we know that Susan is smart enough to figure out the fact that, well, if I just drive, Northeast long enough from LA, at some point I'll get to New York. We know that she'll figure that out. What we don't know is, will she start off on the wrong path? Get on the wrong freeway? How many times will she get lost? How many times will she get turned around and detoured? How many times is she going to stop at places she has no business being in? How much gas is she going to waste? How much energy is she going to burn? All of it. We know that's going to happen. We just don't know how much of it. But again, at some point, we know Susan will end up in New York. What we also don't know is where in New York is she going to end up? She might end up in Buffalo. And like, who the heck wants to be in Buffalo? She might end up in a really dangerous part of the city. And she doesn't want that either. But because the journey took her forever and a day, and she's so frustrated, she's so tired, she's probably pissed at me for playing this game, she's going to get out of her car, check into an Airbnb in, in Buffalo, and just chill out for a minute, right? Re-energize. But instead, if I said, Susan, I want you to drive from New York, I'm sorry, from LA to the M&M store in downtown Manhattan. And this time, you can use any GPS device that you want. Well, now we know exactly what Susan's going to do, right? She's going to plug in m and store on her phone. And what does she get? Google Maps is going to give her the fastest, most effective route to the m and store. And in fact, 
along the way, it's going to keep giving her a more and more efficient path too. This time, Susan's journey won't feel frustrating because she knows she's on the fastest path to the M&M store. And she also knows that she gets M&Ms out of it. Now think about how this relates to most people's careers. They, they start off doing this thing and they're like, oh my God, this sucks. Ah, let me just try this other thing. They go to this other thing. They may like it for a little bit, but then they realize, wait, this is not what I really want to be doing. So then they try this other thing. They go to this company. Then they end up staying at this company for like seven years without any real promotions or pay raises. And they're like, oh, this company sucks. I, I'm not really being challenged here or developed here or grow. I don't know. So then they do this other thing. They just kind of pinball back and forth, left and right, instead of going up. Why is that? It's because they never took the time to figure out what their M&M store is. So step number one is to figure out where do we want to go? And where's, there's a very simple exercise we walk our clients through. Now, when we do this, it's much more in depth. But again, I'm going to keep it somewhat high level. Is what It's a tool called career mapping. So each of us usually have an idea of what we would love to be doing. Or at the very least, we see other people who are three, four, five years ahead of us, 10 years ahead of us doing what we'd ultimately like to do. So one of the things we do with our clients, so let's say, for example, Miriam, she, when she joined our program, she was in a program manager, um, uh, she was in a program or project manager role, I forget, but her goal was, was to be in product management at a senior level. Why? Because she knew that it's more exciting, it's more fulfilling, that's what she always wanted to do, more money, all the things. So the first thing we did was we said, all right, I want you to go and look at 10 different people on LinkedIn who've gone from program slash project management into product or look at 15 of them. And then what she was able to realize was there's a very consistent trend. They all followed a very similar path. So product management was the M&M store. Well, technically for her, it's like VP of product is the M&M store. So then when she was able to reverse engineer it, she was able to see what's her immediate next step. So for those of you who are like, well, I want to be here seven years from now. It's not easy to go from where you are today to where you are seven years from now, but there is a lily pad. There's a linear effect. So look at the people who are ahead of you, three, four, five steps ahead of you. And, and I would look at even 15, 20 different LinkedIn profiles and see if you can determine the common path, and I'm willing to bet that you will, that for the most part, they all generally did the same things, had the same roles, had the same growth, same certifications. What did they do that I haven't done yet allows you to determine what am I supposed to do next? It's kind of like, you know, that Alice in Wonderland scene, if any of you have seen Alice in Wonderland, where she's just running around Wonderland kind of crazy creating a ton of chaos and then she runs into the Cheshire cat and the Cheshire and she's like oh my god tell me where I'm supposed to go and, and, and the Cheshire cat says well where do you want to go and she's like it doesn't matter and then he says well that's easy any road will get you there and so it's the same thing here we're not trying to run around wonderland we're not trying to just bounce around in your career we want to first take a pause and ask ourselves where do we want to be three years five years seven years from now and then we know based on that, what's the right next step? GPS, right? So career mapping is a great tool. So when you do this career mapping tool, you will see, so for example, like if I was an accountant today and I wanted to be a CFO or an SVP of accounting, and I studied 20 different profiles, I will largely find that most of these accountants follow these rules. I'm sorry, these steps. They went from this to this, to this, to this, to this. Now I know, okay, my next goal, I don't need to worry about how do I become a controller or an SVP. I just need to worry about what do I need to do to become a senior accountant? And here's a little secret. If you've been doing this role for at least three to five years, you're probably more than ready to now go to this role. Just because you don't have the title doesn't mean you can't. It's about what has this person done in this role? And have I done at least 60 to 70% of that? And if I have, I'm ready to go to this role. Then once I've done 60 to 70% of what a director would do, then I'm ready to go to this role. And what's really nice is when you know what each step ahead of you has done, it also, it also kind of enlightens you in a way 
and tells you what you need to do in your current role, which means then you can have the right conversations with your managers and say, I want to take on a few of these responsibilities up here. And so then the more of these responsibilities you start taking, the more you e equipped you become to go to the next level. So career mapping is a very powerful exercise to get really clear on what you need to do at each step in order for you to get to the next step. So your action items, first and foremost, is just taking some time to ask yourself, what is my M&M store? And then once we've determined what that is, go and study 15, 20 different profiles of the people who are doing that, which will then give you clarity on what I need to do next. And then once you've determined that next role, then we move on to the resume and the LinkedIn profile. That's why I said your resume never, I'm sorry, your job search never starts with your resume. If you start with your resume and you talk about everything you've ever done, right? That's what most people do. Think about that. They Negative situation, put together a resume, talk about everything they've ever done. If you talk about everything you've ever done, logically, how can you ever expect to get anything other than that? So we want to study where we're going first. Uh, in the chat, can you let me know if this makes sense? I'm going to stop my screen. I just want to see any quick questions. Is this making sense? Is this helpful? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we'll go to the next step for those of you, which is once we know what we're doing, then we move on to writing a LinkedIn profile and a resume. Okay. And again, if you have questions too, just know I'm going to save a large part of this at the end for Q&A. So what's next? I know my next step. Now I let me write my LinkedIn profile and my resume to market that. Now, I want you to think about this kind of differently. Remember how I said everyone's biggest mistake once they enter the job search is they put together a resume and they talk about everything they've done, but then they only attract what they've ever did? There's a reason for that. So the better way to think about your LinkedIn profile and your resume, and by the way, they're, they're synonymous, but just FYI, LinkedIn is way more powerful than just your resume. Um, and if you want to know why, I could talk about it later. The best way to think about your LinkedIn profile and your resume is think of them as just basically a digital advertisement of your skills and capabilities, right? We're basically advertising to the world, here's what I do. Here's what I've done. It's just a digital ad. So if we agree that it's nothing more than a digital advertisement of our skills and capabilities and experiences, then you have to ask yourself, what makes good advertising? And the answer to that marketing 101 is copywriting. Essentially the words that go into the ad. So then what makes good copywriting? Good copywriting requires three things. Number one, who is my target audience? Meaning for you, what is the one job that I'm going after? You never want to go for multiple roles. You don't want to go for a product manager and customer success or customer success in an accounting or strategy. It's like they're too different. So who, what's my, who is my target audience? What's the one role I am targeting? The second part of good copywriting is do I know what's the pain points, problems, initiatives they're trying to solve in this role? So if you're going for a product role, you could study 15, 20, 25 different product manager job descriptions. And what you'll find, just similar to the career mapping exercise, is that each of these job descriptions keep asking for the same thing. If you studied 15 product uh, project manager jobs today, you will always find the same seven things. Have you managed multiple projects on a sim simultaneously? Have you managed budgets? Have you managed timelines? Have you created project documentation or project artifacts? Have you worked cross-functionally with different st stakeholders across engineering, design, leadership, product, finance, marketing, right? It's basically that. So now we know what they're asking for. And then the third part of good copywriting is, can I clearly and articulate how I've done those things in my career? through talking about direct experiences, tangible experiences, whatever. So when you understand 
that your LinkedIn profile on your resume is a, basically a digital ad, then you have to understand, well, what do I need to talk about in this ad? And the answer is you only need to talk about what is relevant to my target audience. There is no need to talk about everything that you've ever done, rather only what is relevant to my target audience. This is why you want to study the job descriptions of the role you're targeting. But to know the role you should target, you want to do the M&M exercise. There's a logical sequence to this. So I'm teaching it in order. Okay, so then what are the four components? We're going to start with LinkedIn, not your resume. What are the four components that make up a strong LinkedIn profile? There's four. The header, the about section, responsibilities, and having data-driven accomplishments. So we're going to break these down. What is the header? The header, think of a header like a teaser trailer to a movie. Not the actual trailer. Have we, you know, anyone in here, have you ever seen a trailer where it's only like three seconds and they just show you something super cool about the movie and you're like, oh my God, that looks awesome. Now I got to check out the full trailer. The header is the teaser trailer of the movie. It makes someone say, I got to see more. And in the header, you don't want to just say something like product manager, program manager, customer success manager. You want to give them a teaser trailer of what you're able to do or what you've been able to accomplish. So here are two really good examples. These are from our uh, program that can have converted extremely well. Customer success manager provide white glove onboarding and adoption for small businesses a small to medium-sized business using SaaS solutions, 1.1 million. So think about it. Look at what she's putting in here. This was a, 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 one of our female clients. She realized after studying job descriptions that they always keep asking for the same things. How much ARR did you manage? How much did you grow ARR by? How many customers could you renew per year? So she just put that. That's it. Same thing with product. Have you delivered products from zero to one? Where have you done it? So she, this person put B2C, B2B, marketplaces, retail, and how much years of experience do you have? This tells a recruiter and or a hiring manager very clearly and very concisely, remember, copywriting, what you're capable of doing, and more importantly, how can you help them? What is relevant to them is what we're putting in the header. So the first section of your a very strong LinkedIn profile is the header. The second section is the about section. This is the, if the header is a teaser trailer, the about section is the actual trailer. The, this kind of tells them at a high level what they can expect if they keep reading. Remember, recruiters on average spend only like six seconds reading a resume. But if it's written well, they'll spend an additional two to three minutes reading it. So this whole process is to get them to keep their eyeballs onto your LinkedIn profile. So the second section is a header. I'm sorry, uh, the about section. And I see this mistake all the time. People use extremely fluffy words. I'm so dynamic. I'm so fast paced. I'm a lifelong learner. And this is fluff. Exclude in words like that. Why is it fluff? Because it's not quantifiable. I don't know what dynamic means. Do you? Does anyone in here really know what dynamic means? I don't think we do. If someone said, what's dynamic mean? And they put a gun to my head, I don't know. So let's just remove it. And then the other thing is, please stop calling yourselves ninjas and gurus and rock stars and whatever. When we see this, like recruiters, and I'm Talking from a, like if I was wearing an executive hat or I don't know what a rock star is. I don't know what a, a ninja product manager is. And also, I don't like when someone calls themselves an expert. And I know I'm being very direct here, but I just think you need to hear this. And I don't even know how to not be direct. If you're proclaiming that you're an expert, that's you tooting your own horn. This like there's a way to brag. And then there's a way just to come across like icky. Using words like expert, guru, non-star, like rock star, whatever. These are like icky ways to brag. So let's remove that. Let's, let's look at two really good examples. 
These have converted really well in our program too. If you guys want to screenshot this, you totally can. Again, you will catch a recording of this. This tells the reader what this person has done, 15 years of experience in product marketing, in gaming and entertainment and toys. Built digital products, go-to-market plans that have led to 1 billion downloads and 200 million in revenue. That's all the reader really needs to know and that they can take products from conception to launch. Let's give you another one. This is for a senior product leader in our program who did over like landed, a, I think it was like a $475,000 package. You will see very little, if any, fluff. All this summary says is what is relevant to the reader. I have 15 years of experience as a product leader working in B2B, B2C, SaaS, and in FinTech and whatever. I built go-to-market strategies. I've gotten buy-in from product leaders, engineering, data, marketing, UX, whatever. And then even more, they took it one step further and they said this. Here's more of what I've done. Incentivizing the reader to continue to stay on their resume or their LinkedIn. FYI, I'm going to give you a little hack here. If you, any of you in here are going for a leadership role, you want to have a bullet like this at the end. How many people throughout the, your career have you helped get promoted into senior level positions? Why is this important? Because if an executive is hiring a leader who's going to be managing other people, two things. One, it's no longer just about what can this person do. It's more about can this person replicate their success? Can this person teach other people how to be just as good as them? Because that makes you infinitely scalable. To, to show that I can, not only am I really good, I can teach other people to be good too. That makes this person, me in this case, way more valuable. Because now the company can see that, ding, if we can create, if, if this person can replicate six versions of himself or herself, we'll be so much stronger, so much better. The second thing it does is it shows to the world, to the, the readers, that you take pride in helping other people develop too. It's no longer just about you. You care about seeing other people su succeed, which is a very strong characteristic trait of a leader. I want other people to, to do well, maybe even better than me. So if you're going for a leadership role, think back on, have I done things directly, indirectly, like mentored people, guided people, put together trainings that have helped people get better at their job or even get promoted? If so, I want to make mention of that. All right. So the second component of a really strong LinkedIn profile is the header. Okay. The third component is the responsibility section. So, sorry, if so, if the header is the teaser trailer, the about section is the actual trailer, the responsibility section is the action sequence that the hero or heroine took to achieve their desired goals. So this tells the world, here's what I actually did. It gives you more validity. Sometimes I see people just say things like, oh, I achieved you know, 100% of my sales quota. Well, it's easy to put something like that. But you also want to add more validity to that statement by saying, here's how I actually did it. So in each one of your jobs, there should be a responsibility section that tells the reader, here's what I did, not just what I achieved. And the other mistake I see a lot of people make is they'll talk, they'll use that section to just talk about the company. And it's like, well, I don't care so much about what the company did or what the company does. I want to know about you. What did you do there? And then what did you help them accomplish? So the third component is a responsibility section. So where would you include this? We have our clients write it for each one of the jobs they've been in. It, and if it's a past job, just write it in past tense. If it's a current job, write it in present tense, okay? Here's a good example of a responsibility section. It briefly says what the company does, but then it goes directly into what did this person do? I led the efforts for Sling TV 
including this, 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 this. Okay. Now, if I'm an executive and I'm hiring this person, I'm capable of seeing, are they, are they capable of doing what they say, you know, of what I need, essentially. Here's another section, uh, as another example of a responsibility section. You can write it in a summary format like this or a bulleted format, doesn't really matter. This girl's been with us. This is uh, someone named Ella. She's been with us since 2016. She's crushed it. Every single time she's able to find a job because her responsibility section clearly tell the reader what she's capable of doing, which then tells them what she can do for them. Advertising. Target audience. Remember all that? Okay, so a few tips on writing good responsibility section. A good way to know what your client is looking for, so what is it that my target audience needs, not your client, but your, your prospective employer, is to study 15 to 20 job descriptions of the one role that you're targeting. And again, once you've studied 25, 20, 15 job descriptions, you will see that there is a common throughput, that each of them keep asking for the same five, six, seven things. If those are the five, six, seven things that you have direct experience with, indirect experience with, some sort of experience with, make sure you make mention of that. Okay? And then make your responsibilities action-oriented. Built, led, managed, developed, collaborated, etc. Okay? And if you're going to use the bulleted format, no more than five to seven bullets. All right, the fourth and most the fourth and most important section of a, a really good LinkedIn profile is the accomplishment section. So the header is the teaser trailer. The about section is the actual trailer. The responsibilities is the action sequence. And then the accomplishments is the happily ever after. I did all these things. What did that lead to? Okay. This is the section you get to brag. Here's really good examples, two examples of an accomplishment section. This person was going for a leadership role. That's why they started with this. But if you, so in customer success, how much did they upsell? How much did they grow ARR? You know, all the things that matter because we study the job descriptions. Here's another one for a director of product. If you can get it quantifiable, if you can give quantifiable data, it makes it stand out. Just so you know, data always moves the mind of the reader. Data moves the mind of the reader. So sometimes I get questions like, well, what if I don't have the exact data? A lot of people don't. So in this case, I would say guesstimate. <laughs> I'm not saying that you should ever blatantly lie but you kind of have a rough idea of what you did. So you can mention a rough data point. This is not going to be verifiable, but it helps you stand out. And if you absolutely don't have the data, then just talk about the thing you did that helped in some way, shape or form without the data. Okay, so great examples of summaries and achievements. This is how it looks all together. Um, how are we doing so far? Are we sleeping? Helpful? Yeah, can I get some taking notes? Uh, real quick, Melanie, thank you so much. Okay, is this fluff? Am I giving you fluff? Nope. Good. Can I share my screen and show you a LinkedIn profile of how this all looks? Would that be helpful? Okay. Give me a second. I'm going to just share my screen and show you how it would look. I'll give you those same examples. Ella, a few of these people. Okay, so now you'll see, how do we tie all of this together? By the way, remember, if you want a free seat, take a picture of something and then tag it. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Okay. So here is one of those examples that I shared with you. 
Dane Ben Dixon. This guy went through our program, absolutely crushed it. Here is his header, remember? Here is his summary. Let me zoom in so you can see it, sorry. The about section, okay? And then you go down to his jobs. This was the job he got through the program. So he, he doesn't have anything there yet. But if you go to any of these, you'll see, here's what I did, responsibilities, action sequence in the movie, happily ever after, here's what I achieved. Here's what I did, here's what I achieved. Same thing here, here's what I did, Here's what I achieved. Here, I'll give you Ella's. Ella, absolute beast. Okay. If you go to the summary, so here's the header. This was drawn out before, but we're going to have to get on for about section. Here's what I did. Right Here's like what you can expect to see if you keep watching this movie. If you want to add like stuff like this, it's totally fine. It just helps with like keyword optimization, which I'll dive into in a second. Go down. Remember I gave you the cornerstone on demand example. This is hers. Here's what I did. Here's the happily ever after. Each job, you guys. Here's what I did. Here's what I accomplished. Cool? So now you know where each of them go. All right. Let me go back to that horrible slide deck that I built. We haven't seen any watermarks yet, huh? It's kind of cool. Maybe Canva's doing me a solid. Um, okay. If you ever want to see me get pissed, ask me about this. Wait, is, it, is my screen sharing? Oh, no, it's not sharing. No. Sorry. <laughs> All right. If you ever want to see me get pissed, ask me about this. I hear this all the time. Should I put this? If I put this, I'm going to look desperate. Right? We hear this. Some of you have may have felt this. It does not make you look desperate. When you see a job posting on a company page or on LinkedIn or on Indeed, is the company desperate because they're hiring? No, they're just telling you what they need, right? Whoever suggests that this makes you look desperate is a, and then you can fill in the blank because I got a lot of words I could fill in the blank with here. It does not make you look desperate. And if anything, just so you guys know, recruiters will filter by people who have open to work. They have the ability to do that. The, 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 the thought process behind that is if I'm reaching out to somebody who is open to work, they'll probably reach out to me a lot faster versus going after some passive candidate who may or may not be super happy in their role. So who would I rather talk to if I'm hiring for a position? Someone who's way more closer to making a decision or someone that I have to convince forever in a day. So if you're saying you're open to work, it does not make you look desperate. I just want to say that. Okay, we'll move on to the resume. But just so you know, once you've done this LinkedIn, your resume is 95% done. Now you can just copy and paste everything. They should be like a replica of each other. So what are your resume? What's your resume need? The obvious stuff is name, contact info, but it also needs a summary, responsibilities, and accomplishments for each job. How do you write it? I know this is maybe silly, but just so you know, this is how you write it, okay? No, nothing to really go into here. Oh, keep it a zip code. Keep it a zip code, not a city. Not You'll see why in a second. Um, you wanna see something super cool? Watch this. Where is this? So the book that all of you are going to get, if you go to, this is the book. If you go down here to chapter four, the resume, don't worry about rewriting your entire resume. 
we actually wrote resume templates for you. So they're completely templatized. You can just come here, click on whatever your skill set is. So long as we have, if you're a program manager, just go to program manager. First, it'll tell you what recruiters look for. This is what recruiters want to see. And then you can come down and we already wrote the resume for you. You just have to insert your information and, and remove this and insert yours. Okay. So we've already written the whole thing for you. But anyway, I'm still going to show you this just so you, you have it. Um, where are we going? All right. How do I present this? Okay. So that's that. Keep it a zip code. You'll see why. What to avoid? Charts, graphs, skills ratings. You know what I mean by skills ratings? Some resumes you'll put like, oh, I'm a 7 out of 10 at this, and I'm a 9 out of 10 at that, and I don't, don't have things like that. The simplest resumes always convert the best. I just showed you the template. Like it, it was very simple. It converts the best, especially when you go to a, a like a job board and you have to upload your resume and then it parses that resume onto the job board. If you have graphs and things like that, it makes it look all wonky and then it won't show up on a search result. Never worry about your resume going past one page. Nobody cares. This was information that was given out in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when people were like literally faxing in and mailing in resumes and recruiters got so tired of having stacks of paper on their desk that they said, give it to me in one page, make it one page. Then they started telling that to career counselors and college counselors. And so college counselors adopted that. Nowadays, we don't fax in anything. We don't mail in anything. It's all digital. Recruiters don't usually print resumes. So Rule of thumb is if you have less than five years, keep it one page, less than 10 years, two page, less than three years, 15. And if you have more or uh, less than 15 years, three pages, if you have more than 15 years of experience, don't, don't even go past it. You don't need to. And it helps you avoid age bias, which is a real thing. It sucks, but it's a real thing. Okay. Anybody ever heard the saying that um, the best place to hide a dead body is in, in page two of a Google search? Why? Because we never go there, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with resumes, just so you know. Um, resumes and LinkedIn profiles, but specifically resumes. Uh, websites websites rank on what's called search engine optimization, SEO, as we've heard of. Resumes rank based on keyword optimization. The more keywords you have in your resume, the higher it ranks on a job board. The less, it goes back. Recruiters, if they can find all the candidates they need on page one, they have no incentive to go to page two. Okay. So here's a really cool tool. I'm not sponsored by these guys. So don't like, I don't make any money off of it. But if you, if you want to know if your resume is keyword optimized or not, use this tool. It's called jobscan.co. Essentially what it does, it's, there's like a free version of this. You can put paste your resume on one side paste the job description on the other, click scan, and then it'll just tell you how much of a match it is. Here's what I know. And if I was sponsored by them, I wouldn't tell you this. Job search or job scan is a company. And just like every company, they're going to try to make dollar dollar bills, right? So of course it incentivizes them to rank your thing low. So we've been studying and using this tool in our program. If this thing gives you a 60, 65, 70 or 75% match rating, you're good. It is very hard to get 100 or 90. And the reason is because they want you to pay for their services and they'll write your resume, all the things. It's like, dude, don't ever pay anyone to write your resume. We already wrote it for you, okay? So if you get a, I put a score of 75% is great, but even 60 is fine, okay? It's a really good tool. Just use it wisely. All right. Do you remember a few minutes ago, I said, instead of putting the city on your zip, on your resume, you want to have a zip code. Here's the reason for that. Anybody here ever go on like uh, in the chat? You could put this uh, so I can read it. Have you heard or uh, have, has anyone ever gone on like Zillow or Redfin or like anywhere to search for homes? And you will see like how long that home has been on the market. Has it? Does anyone here know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That that tool, that little feature is called, 
man, there's so many people keep coming in. That tool is called an aging mechanism. Okay? Job boards have aging mechanisms. So if you uploaded your resume today, Muhammad, and seven months from now, it's you're still on the job market, the recruiter is going to know your resume was uploaded seven months ago. What does the recruiter think? The same thing we think if we're on Redfin and we're like, wait, that home's been on the market for like three months. Something's wrong there. Someone must have died in there. I'm not going near there. There's something wrong with it, right? However, on this job board, here's the craziest hack of all. And I don't know why they haven't caught on to this, but if you go on to every job board where your resume is uploaded and you just change one thing about your zip, uh, your, your resume every week, then it just doesn't show them when it was originally uploaded. It just shows them when it was recently updated. So now the recruiter has no idea when you originally uploaded your resume. So this is why we say have a zip code on there versus city. Because if you live in San Francisco, for example, there's like 50 zip codes in San Francisco. So you could just keep removing one for the other, keep removing one for the other. Okay. So just wanted to give you that hack. And it, it's nice because it also ranks your, your resume. If it's keyword optimized, it just moves it back on top of the job search or the job board. Okay. So your action items here, 15 to 20 descriptions, study them for the role you're targeting. Then use our resume template that you'll get in that guide to build your resume to look like that and your LinkedIn profile to look like the one I shared. And then if you really want to see if it's keyword optimized or not, you can just use jobscan.co or something like that or something like Teal. It's like free. And then every Sunday, we, we tell this to our clients, every Sunday, just change one thing and then get it refreshed. All right. So. Here's what we've covered. One, we know what our M&M store is. We know where we're going. Based on that, we also know that um, what role we should be going for next. Based on what role we're going for next, we're going to rewrite our LinkedIn profile and our resume to be keyword optimized to match only that, that, that next role, marketing. Now, what is the biggest problem every job seeker faces? They're spending countless hours applying to jobs, right? How many times have we gone on LinkedIn and seen something like, oh my gosh, I've applied to 900 jobs. I've applied to 800 jobs. I've applied to thousands of jobs and they don't get anything. But then they keep doing it. We're not going to do that. In school, we are taught to not cut in line. In life, it's all about cutting in line so long as you're doing it morally. And so this step, part three, is what's going to allow you to cut in line, okay? And what this means is we're going to reach out directly to hiring managers, senior leaders, and executives, and maybe even recruiters who work at the companies that you want to target or work at, okay? So the first thing in intentional networking is we're going to create a list of people who work at the companies we wanna work at. We're going to not easy apply and we're going to instead reach out directly to executives and hiring managers. And when we reach out, we're not going to say something super generic like, hi, my name is Gene and I saw this job that I think I'm a good fit for and I'd love to chat with you. That message never works. Because what I'm basically saying is, hey, super duper busy executive, why don't you take the time out of your busy day to go look at my LinkedIn profile, connect the dots yourself and figure out how I'm a good fit. Never works. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to send value added reach out. So in this part, I'm going to show you how you find them. And then I'm going to show you what to say to them. So the first approach we use is called the direct approach. This is the easiest approach that you can go for. What we're going to do is type in in this search bar the name of your position and the word hiring customer success and hiring. 
project manager and hiring, product manager and hiring, director of media and hiring, whatever it is, okay? Then just click see all results and then filter by people or posts. And what you will get is a list of people that are literally saying they are hiring. Some of these will be recruiters, but other, these, other people are just senior leaders saying, hey, we have these openings at our company. Our clients love this approach. They love it. So what you're going to do is you're going to connect with them. And you could just say something as simple as, good to meet you here. Great to connect with you here in the connection request. Okay, we're seeing about a 47.7% conversion rate right now. If all we say in the connection request is great to connect with you here. Don't go into something super crazy or specific or generic. Just great to meet with you here. Then after, you, after they connect back with you, then you're going to use a script like this. I saw that you were hiring for a VP. And I notice you're looking for somebody who has experience doing X, Y, and Z. Here's the message. And we always add a little call to action like this. And when we add a call to action, they usually respond faster. You could even put a Calendly link. Okay. This is telling them, remember copywriting, advertising, this is telling them, I know exactly what pain points you're feeling, what you're trying to achieve, and let me just share with you how I've already done that for other companies and what I was able to achieve by doing it. And then we're just saying, do you have some time to chat? Okay, that will get interviews. The second way to do it is just by target the company. See this client here, this, this person right there? That's an old client of ours. This is exactly what she did. She saw that at Sirius XM, there was a role that she was interested in. So let's say you were looking for a product manager role and you see this job for growth and acquisition. Then you're going to go to the company profile. So you would go to Sirius XM on LinkedIn and click people. And then once you click people, you will type in the people who work on this team. Product manager growth. Because that's what they were looking for here. Product manager growth. Now you'll find a bunch of people who work on this team. And then you're going to message them. Here's what's cool. These people might be your colleagues. So it, it's in their best interest to hire somebody or work with somebody that they actually like. And then you're going to use the same script. See this script right here? <clears throat> this works like crazy. I was doing some research on the next steps of my career and I came across your profile. How you've navigated your career since blank has been inspiring. Would you be open to a 10 minutes coffee chat to share a little bit about what you've learned? The recommended strategy that we tell our clients is 80% of your time should be focused connecting with directly hiring managers and recruiters who work at your target company. 15% should be focused on how do I ex reach out to my existing network, extended network, et cetera. And then if you really want to feel better at night and it helps you sleep better at night, then just spend 5% of your time applying. 80, 15, 5, all you need. Oops. Um, hold on. I don't know what just happened. Sorry. See this? Here's a past client of ours named Mehul. <clears throat> Mehul worked at Chipotle in a director of finance role. He wanted to, he was looking for a new job and he wanted to level up. Who did he reach out to? The CFO of freaking Qdoba, its direct competitor. The CFO. Look at this note. 
I hope that my note finds you safe and well. I was doing some research on the next steps of my career. I came across your profile. How you've been able to navigate is so inspiring. What does he do? Happy to connect. Thanks for reaching out. I'd love to have a more proper introduction if you're up for it. Do you have some time to connect this week? Take your shot, man. Who better? Who's going to champion you for a position inside of a company you want to work at more than a C-level executive? You guys want to know, when I worked at Overstock, uh, the freaking, the founder of Overstock, he's a billionaire. His dad started Geico. He's the founder. You have no idea how many times per week I would get an email from him or he would come to my desk and he would say, I want you to interview this guy. And then I would look at the email and I would see that this person just randomly reached out to Patrick, that was his name, and hit it off. And now they've convinced Patrick to interview them. And I better have a, a really good reason to say no to Patrick. So same with this approach. It's like if you, one way is to apply, which gets nothing. The second way is to try to go after all the recruiters who work there, which hardly gets anything. Or the third way is to go after people who people are too scared to go after, C-level folks or VPs or, or leaders. Look at this. This is our client, Jonathan. He uses the same script. This guy's a director at Uber. He sends a script, and then what does Ross do? Responds to him. Then he did the same thing at DoorDash. This was not that long ago. This is our client, Ben. Ben got 16 freaking calls from doing a two-step approach. Step one, the connection request, which you see right here. Step two, when they connect back, boom. Call to action. Want more examples? 99% of our clients inside of our program are averaging eight interviews per search. They're interviewing with eight different companies. And it's always coming from this approach, outreach. Look at this. Left and right, you can get more. I can give you more and more examples of this. This was not this one. This was last week. This is our client, Wesley. I call him my teddy bear client because he looks like, he literally looks like a teddy bear. When, when he joined our program, he had no experience. Okay. He would study like Hampton or Hampshire College. They give you this, it's a, it's a unique college. They let you kind of study whatever you want to study. And so a lot of the things he would study would be around like aliens. And, I was, and then he came to me and he's like, hey, I really want you to help me get into a product role. I was like, bro, you have no experience. You studied aliens. I don't know how I'm supposed to help you. But he, he sold me big time. Anyway, so the first job I got him, he got from outreach was 63,000. Remember how I said outreach has a long lasting effect if you do this. And this whole thing that the reason you guys are all here is because you want to build a, a successful career, not just get a job. This is the examples of what can happen if you do it correctly. So he gets this job, immediately gets promoted into a product role, gets what he wants, right? Then gets promoted again, goes from 63,000 to 90,000. Great. He decides to leave. How does he get this job from Snap to Atrium? He started reaching right back out to everyone he built a relationship with during his outreach process. <clears throat> and now he is a, he get a he got a one hundred twenty five thousand dollar pay rate. So he goes from ninety to one twenty five. Awesome, right? He gets laid off. This is right in the thick of COVID, right? Right when COVID happened was March twenty twenty or whatever. He gets laid off. In less than twenty nine days, he gets this job, and he goes from one twenty five to two fifty. How did he get this job so fast in COVID? Outreach. He just started reaching right back out to the people he was connecting with. So outreach has a really long lasting effect if you do it correctly. All of these things I just shared with you, this example, these examples, this example, 16 interviews, this example, these are all from outreach. They're not spending any time applying. 
Think about how much easier your interview process will be if you start with a senior leader on the inside of a company who's going to champion you throughout the whole interview process. This guy, because of outreach, got a 100K increase. Remember that contact I made via LinkedIn? We sent her a Starbucks gift card. He, she introduced him to someone that she knows. He and I had an exploratory call. He got a new role, interviews him. 100K increase. Outreach has long-lasting effects. So your action items are these. If you use the script I shared, you would make it unreasonable for them to reach out to you, to not reach out to you. And I want to share a statistic, and that's 47%. Our clients, when they do outreach, average a 35 to 47% conversion rate. What's a conversion rate? Meaning they send a message, someone says, let's talk. Okay. I don't know if you guys have heard of Teal. I'm sure a lot of you have. Teal did this massive survey last year where they surveyed, I, I think, oh God, I forget. It's like thousands of job seekers. And they found that applying to jobs at best was resulting in a 2% conversion rate. At best. 100 jobs applied to, two interviews. So where do you want to spend your time? Where you get 2% conversion rate? or at worst, 35% conversion rate. Heck, let's say you did this, you never work with us, you're just using these scripts, you might even get a 20% conversion rate, but even at 20%, you've 10x the results that you would get from applying. Okay, real quick. I wanna share something too. Um, where is this? Oh, okay. So look at this. Um, dang it. All right. So this guide, remember this guide that I shared with you? The, the feel good career. If you go to getting interviews, Chapter five, it's going to give you all of the different buckets that you can play in. These are five different ways you can land more interviews. And we share the, each script that you should be sending based on the person you're reaching out to, okay? There's, like, there's another bucket right there. And then there's another bucket right there. And then there's another bucket. So each one has its own unique scripts. So you're, you're going to learn how to do this. So in here, you the presentation you probably saw, I said like user groups and stuff like that. Um, it'll tell you that. And then we even link all the different user groups and more like that. So you're going to understand how to do it. And then we tell you how to even execute this at the most granular level on a daily basis, how to execute the outreach strategy. So you'll have all of that. All right, let me go back to this. Okay, so listen, we're at two... What are we, dude? We're at th 30 more minutes left. Are you guys hanging in? Do you guys want a break? You want to use the restroom? No break, keep going. Hanging in there, good, keep going. Good, no all right. I'm getting more no breaks than breaks. All right, we're down to the final two things. So think about what we've done up until now. We've determined our M&M store. We know where we're going. Secondly, we now know what's our next role, what's our next step, what's the next job we're targeting based on our long-term goals. Now, we've already written the resume and the LinkedIn profile to speak to that one role. Then we've spent, the, we use the 80 15, 5 format strategy, whatever you want to call it, to get in front of hiring managers, senior leaders, executive recruiters to get more interviews. So now what's left? You got to crush the interview, right? Dum, dum, dum. This is where everyone freaks out. So I'm going to walk you through how we prep for interviews. Okay. How am I doing? 
You guys feeling kind of rejuvenated? You seeing hope? Does it seem crazy? Or does it seem logical? I hope you, all right. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm forgetting how to share my screen. All right, so when we prep with our clients, we have a rule in our program. Miriam knows this if she's still on, that you're not allowed to go on an interview unless you've prepped with one of the coaches first. We prep our clients before every interview, and these are the things that we go over with them. We use a process called consultative interviewing. And why do we call it that? Um, I saw somebody in here I know. He works at a consulting firm. He can attest to this. Uh, have you seen, like, do you ever wonder why, like, Deloitte, McKinsey, Accenture, Bain, they can go and sell these massive projects to companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, Sony, Apple for like a gazillion dollars. You guys ever seen that? Do you know why they can do that? I'll tell you what they're not doing. They're not going to Disney and saying, hey, we can do this thing for you. We're really good at this thing. We can do it faster than anybody else. They're not doing anything like that. What they're actually doing is they're going to Disney and they'll say, hey, Disney, I heard that you're building a new mobile parks app, uh, an application for all of your mobile parks and resorts. Is that true? They're like, yeah, they're like, we'd love to learn a little more about that. What are you guys working on? What technology stack are you using? How many people do you have working on it? What's your budget for that? How long is this going to take? What's your estimated timeline? What happens if you go after the timeline? Oh, you're going to, what happens if you go past budget? Oh, okay. So like they're fact finding constantly, but what are they finding facts about? Disney's pain points. So then what does Deloitte do or McKinsey or any of them? They'll say, okay, cool. Let us go back and, and see if we can actually help with this. I don't know if we can. So then they go back, put together a proposal. And they're like, hey, Disney, actually, you know what? We have a whole team that we can deploy to this that will be kind of the fraction of a cost that you're, you're spending. We can do it in about two months less than what you have budgeted. And we have this tech stack, so you don't even have to buy it, whatever. They come back and they're like, we understood all of your problems, and here's how we're going to help you solve them. Oh, by the way, it's going to be a gazillion dollars. And Disney's like, oh, cool, cool. Okay, here's a gazillion dollars. Now Deloitte won another gazillion dollar. Why did they do that? Because they made Disney sell to them. What are your pain points? What are you feeling? Why is it not working? What are your bottlenecks? Deloitte's like, or I mean, Disney's like, here's all of our pain. And Deloitte just addresses their pain, right? You're going to do the same in the interview. The best interviewers are really good at extracting the pain points of the companies they're talking to and then positioning themselves as the solution to the pain points. You're going to do the same. You do not want to come across as someone looking for some job. You want to come across as the solution to the problem a company is facing. So what is the first question we coach our clients on asking? Miriam can tell you this. We always say, if the interview started today, and let's say Joe was going to interview me, I would always say, Joe, thank you so much for making the time to meet with me today. This uh, I'm excited to jump into it. But before I do, I'm really curious. Was there anything specific about my background that made you want to meet with me? Or was there anything about my experience in general that made you want to meet with me? And now Joe will say, yeah, you know what, Gaurav, I love how you've done this, or I want to learn more about that. I'm very curious about this. I saw that you did this. Joe is spoon feeding me the answers. Right? Now I know in my head what is relevant to Joe and more importantly, what is not. So everything I talk about is what's going to be relevant to him, right? That's why we ask this question. This is like a huge cheat code, huge cheat code. This is our client. Uh, his name's Fahim, even though I scratched his name out, so whatever. Look at this. My entire game plan was something else, and I switched it upon on the spot once she spoon-fed me the answers. She told me what she also wants to talk about tomorrow. 
pretty crazy, right? So that's the beginning of the interview. That's the number one question you want to ask. Then comes the middle of the interview, which is where they're going to ask you to tell me about yourself. They're going to say, they're, that's when they dive into behavioral questions, <clears throat> situational questions, technical questions, like tell me about a time when, how would you handle blank? If you had multiple projects and had to work across multiple stakeholders, but they all had conflicting priorities, how would you handle that? Those are questions that the, these are situational behavioral questions. So in the middle is where you're going to use things like the star format, whatever. But however, the middle part of the interview is also your opportunity to keep digging into their pain points. And these are some powerful questions you can ask to understand what they actually need. So you can keep positioning yourself as a solution to those pain points. How are you measuring success in this role? Heck, you could take it further <clears throat> and say, how are you measuring success across the first 60, 90 days, six months, and one year? What are the current bottlenecks that you're experiencing today? Another great question that demonstrates EQ is, if I were to come on to this team, how would I make your life and the team's life easier? Now they're going to keep telling you about pain points. Now, when they say, tell me about yourself, this is not your like opportunity to talk about everything you've ever done. Remember, you're going to keep it relevant to what they need. So the, the format we always use is DLAT, DLAT, right? Just here's what I've done. Here's what I've learned along the way. Here's what we've achieved. And you're tying it all into what they need. So that question of like, what was it about my background and all that? They're going to tell you what they need. So then they'll usually say, so tell me a little bit about you, Joe. And you could say, sure. You know, for the last 15 years, I've been in product management. I've worked across the B2C, B2B, and, you know, fintech space. And I've specifically worked on developing mobile applications that have allowed our, you know, users to seamlessly integrate their bank accounts into this thing and whatever. And as a result, our, like, subscriptions have grown and our monthly active users have grown and our revenue grew by this. And it was amazing. Um, and I've had to do it while working cross-functionally, across finance, legal, regulatory compliance, marketing, UX, and, and UI to develop all of the product strategies, product roadmaps, go to market. Um, and it's been a fun ride. And what I've learned along the way has been blah, blah, blah. Everything that that person just said right there was tied into what this person needs. But I'm then you say, but I'm happy to go into something you know more specific if you're looking for that. I know that was a high-level overview. I'm happy to go into specifics. Now, the other thing you want to make sure you're doing is not being transactional. What is a transactional interview? It's where they ask you a question, you answer. They ask you a question, you answer. Right? Think about, I'm going to stop my screen for a second. Think about when you've gone on a date or when you've hung out with a friend after a really long time. And if you go on this date or you hang out with this friend and all this person does is talk about themselves, you probably leave that experience feeling a little like, oh, that wasn't that cool right? Why? Because that person only talked about themselves and never made it about you. In an interview, even though they're asking you the questions, you still, when you can, you want to make it about them. So you insert feedback loops. So when they ask you, Shahaz or whatever, Scott, tell us about a time when you did X. And then you use the star format to go into it. You, would, you can insert a feedback loop and say something like, but I'm so curious to know, how have you dealt with that in your career? You've probably seen that experience many times. How have you, how have you have been able to handle that? Or I know that was such a simple way of doing it. Is there a much more effective way? Or how's the team handling? Or would that work here? Now what you're doing is you're creating a two-way conversation. And as you're asking some of these feedback loop questions, you're actually seeing how the interviewer thinks in real time. So if what you're saying is not in alignment with how they think or how they do the things that they do, you can quickly start kind of like pivoting some of your future responses, your subsequent responses. So it's really important to ask feedback loops so you understand how they think and you keep it conversational. Okay, a few more things I want you to be fully aware of when everyone's heard about the star format. I'm not gonna go into that. Remember the feedback loop and asking them questions about themselves allows you to be, you want to be interested in them. Too many people try to come across interesting and then they give off this weird vibe. 
So we're not trying to be interesting. You already got the interview. Don't worry about being interesting. Be interested. Feedback loops, again, allow you to make it a dialogue versus a monologue. When I used to do these workshops in person, I would stop and ask a bunch of questions or whatever. Um, I don't know why this person's able to write on this thing. If you're able to write on it, don't write on it. Yeah, you could write on it when I share the thing, okay? Sorry um, about that. I thought it was just for me. <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all about you? No, I'm kidding. Okay, last reminder, practical application versus theory. What does this mean? So in an interview, sometimes they will say, Susan, tell me about a time when you've done blank. Or tell me how you would handle X, Y, Z. It's easy to go right into what you would do. Well, what I would do is, one, I would do that. Two, I would do this. Three, I would do that. It's easy to go into that, right? But that's not showing the depth of your experience. In fact, when you do that, you're actually underselling yourself because now you're speaking theoretically. Here's what I think I do. Instead, you could just say, here's what I have done. Or if it's not a direct one-to-one -one experience, if you've never done the thing that they're asking about, be honest but still re redirect them to something else. So you could say, well, I've never actually worked on that specifically, but there was a time when I was at XYZ company where we had to work on blah, blah, blah. And it was, the process was similar. And here's what we did. Answer the question. And then you would respond with a feedback loop. Would, did, that, did that help? Would that work here? Any other specifics I can give you? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, so practical application versus theory. Theory doesn't showcase the depth of your experience keeps you very generalist. Practical application showcases the depth, lets them know what you know what you're talking about. It adds validity. Dialogue versus monologue allows you to build a real relationship. Interested versus interesting allows you to build a real relationship. Okay, next. This is crazy and we get feedback all the time about this one. This, not this one actually, the one that comes right after it. So if you want to blow them away, the second to last question you can ask them as the interview is wrap, wrapping up is just say, thank you so much, Joe, for making this time to meet with me today. It was really helpful. Uh, before we end, can I quickly recap what I think you're looking for in this role? Could I quickly recap what I think you're looking for in this role? The answer, 10 out of time, 10 out of 10 times will be yes. Okay. Now, when you regurgitate back what they're looking for, you don't talk about everything they're looking for, like in the job description. What you're doing is you're regurgitating the pain points. So it looks like you're trying to implement this mobile application that's going to allow for a subscription, subscription based model, right? In the next six months. But it seems like you're extending your timeline now to nine months. And if we do that, it will end up going over budget by this much. Is that right? And right now, the biggest bottleneck seems to be that the design and engineering are completely off or you haven't gathered enough requirements. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And so what you're really hoping for someone to come in and do is achieve X, Y, Z. Is that right? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. So what you've done before you've left the interviews, you've shown them like, I understand your pain points. And I understand what you're trying to do to solve them. It's like, I hear you. It's very like psychological kind of thingy. I don't know what the word is pack, but it allow when someone feels heard after talking to you for 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, it makes them feel really good. Like, okay, I could trust this person. <laughs> then you go into this last question, which is thank you again for taking the time to meet with me today. Before we wrap up, I'd love to ask, was there anything about my background that concerns you about my ability to step into this role and be effective? because I'd love to clarify or confirm your concerns. Now, here's the funny thing. Anytime we've shared this with people on LinkedIn, inevitably what we will get back is, I've heard not to do this. If I do this and they, if I, if they bring up something negative, now I'm leaving them with a negative thought, right? Some negative perception. Say yes if you've heard that, if you have. I can't even see if you're saying yes yet. Actually, I can, but... Um, have you heard that before? Yeah, okay. For one time in your life, try it. Here's why this is different. 
because I'd love to clarify or confirm your concerns. You know how confident you have to be to say, I want to confirm your concerns? Now, when they give you a concern, we're going to use this methodology called cupcake versus cake. And here's why we do this in general. Because whether or not you ask this question, I promise you, if there is a concern about you, whether you ask it or not doesn't make it different, like doesn't make it go away. Throughout the interview, they've developed a concern if there is one. I don't want to go to sleep at night knowing that there is a concern in their head that I did not address. Because if there is a concern and you did not address it, now that concern that concern begins to fester. And they will talk about that concern with all these subsequent interviewers. Okay. So instead, I want you to bring it up and say, listen, Joe, before we wrap up, I just want to ask, is there, do you have any concerns about my ability to step into this role and be effective? Because if you do, I'd love the opportunity to clarify or confirm your concerns. Now, let's say he brings up a concern and it's valid. So let's say he's like, you know what? My only concern is that you don't know how to bake a cake. Okay. And let's say that's a valid concern. Now, the normal response would be like, oh, no, 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 no. I do know how to bake a cake. Or, oh, no, no, no. I could learn how to bake a cake. So what have you done right there? You've deflected Joe's concern, showing him that you're not even listening and you're going into straight sales pitch now. We don't want to deflect anybody's concern. We want to absorb someone's concern. So instead, the way you respond, you take them from an, you want to say, I've heard it and I'm going to take you from a negative to a positive. So you would say, you know what, Joe, you're absolutely right. I actually have no experience baking a cupcake. However, at my last company, one of the things I was tasked to do often was to bake a cake. And when I started there, I didn't know how to bake any cake. In fact, I didn't even know how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Ha ha ha, throw in something funny. However, what I did was every single night, I would go and watch YouTube videos and study different recipes. I bought 17 different recipe books. I would stay up sometimes 1 a.m., 2 a.m. every single night baking and testing different recipes. And at first, no one would go near them. Trust me, like they were gross. However, right around that 30th day mark, they started improving. So then I even start working with some of our other bakers to see how they would bake their cakes. And what was really cool was by less than two months, I had actually one of the best selling cakes at the company. But by the end of the month, my red velvet cake was the best one. And, and I would take a similar approach to, to the, the lear learning how to bake a cupcake too. Is that helpful? I've absorbed his concern and that taken him back from a negative to a positive because I've shown him like I can still overcome this concern because I've overcome something in the past that was once a concern too. Had I not said anything, Joe would have went to sleep at night, told his team about my concern. Okay. Now let's say Joe brings up the same example. Gaurav, my only concern is you don't know how to bake a cake. But in this scenario, I actually do know how to bake a cake. A cake. How horrible would that have been if you didn't ask this question and he went home with a concern that was not even valid? So instead, what we would do is still absorb it. The common response here is, oh, no, 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 I do know how to bake a, a cake. Oh, no, 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 I, I can bake a cake. Now that, that whole hour, 30 minutes, whatever you spend building relationships, breaking down that wall, gone right back up. Because the second you say, oh, no, 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 I can, he's going to be like, damn, here comes the sales pitch. Okay. So instead, we absorb it. And we're like, you would just say, you know what? That's my fault. I should have done a better job of clarifying your concern. I actually do have experience baking a cake. In fact, when I was at XYZ Company, that's like what I did 30% of the time. And here's how I did it. And here's what I was able to achieve as a result. So, so sorry for not being able to clarify that. Now that concern he has is gone. Done. And I've absorbed it. I didn't try to sell him. I just absorbed it. This is why we ask that question. We want an opportunity to clarify a concern or make sure that they don't have some concern that's invalid. 
And we want to leave them with a positive impression, not a negative one. And again, even if you don't ask us, ask this question, their concern will be there. All right. There's a lot to the interview process uh, in that guide that I've been sharing over and over again. There's like a, it, it goes way deeper into that. So you'll be able to catch everything you can. Um, all right. Now we're on to the final thing. So if you've done all of this correctly, you will get to an offer. And it will not just be an offer. It'll be an offer at a company that you actually admire for a job you actually want, doing something that you actually like. This is all about being intentional. But now is the final step, and we want to make sure you get paid what you're worth. So remember, first thing is first. Negotiation is not just about base salary alone. There's so many things you can negotiate. Ben, and, and sorry, like you don't only want to consider, but you want to consider everything. Does this job have upward mobility? Do I get to work with great people? Do I like the work I'd be doing? Does this have good perks? Does it have good benefits? Do I Will I be mentored here? Is there a good work life balance? Keep all of this into consideration because if the pay is 10K lower than what you could make, 15K lower, but you get all the other things or some of these other things that are that are might more important in this season of your life, then it won't be that bad. So always ask yourself, what is the most important thing to me at this season of my life? Okay. Now, I think... A big mistake that most people make is when they give them, when they receive an offer and they don't like the offer, they'll just say, no, I would like this instead. Or is there any way you can do this instead? But when you ask for, like, if you just say, I don't want this and I want this, it is very easy for the company to just be like, nope, right? You're making it too. Easy. So then if you're like, well, can you increase it to, to 210 instead of 200? Nope. Okay. Can I get a better title then? Nope. Okay. Would you be open to do a sign on bonus? Nope. Oh, dang. So each time your position gets weaker and weaker and weaker. So we use what we call the Chinese menu philosophy. This is the, the, the context behind this is think about any time we go into a restaurant, right? We get seated. And what's the first thing they do? They hand us the menu. And then when we look at the menu, we're like, okay, we have all the free will in the world. We can pick from anything that we want, right? Unless you're at Cheesecake Factory, which literally you can have anything you want, you most of the time can't. Because technically, you're just picking from the options they gave you, right? So how much free will do you actually have? Not much. So it's the same thing in this scenario. When we go back to them with a counter offer, we're going to give them options. Here's what I mean. So let's say they gave you a base of 200K, but we know you could make 225. So the first option you give them would be gosh, something, a slight, like the highest thing. So you let's say you give them three options. The first option would be like, hey, instead of 200, would you be open to either 225 that's option one. Option two, would you be open to 210 and maybe a 5K sign-on or a 10K sign-on? Or option three, how about 205, a, a 15K sign-on and a higher title? And, and again, you have to know what to research. And if I keep going on how to research, it'll take forever. But this is what we write for our clients. So you give them options. Now, what's funny is you're, you're giving that, like they're going to get the impression that the ball is in their court that they get to pick and choose. But really, they're picking from any of the same op the options that you gave them. So who's who's really has the free will here? Watch, I'll show you how this works. I know I might be confusing you. This is a client who went got an offer from TikTok, okay? Here was his original pay or offer. 140 salary, 25% bonus, 425 hours used. Total comp, 195, okay? Here is the offer we wrote for him. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a, the, the Chinese menu philosophy offer. Now, keep in mind several things. One, we're being extremely kind. Thank you for the offer. Super excited about potentially working with you. I want to be honest about the numbers. 
I'd like to respectfully ask if there's any flexibility to close the gap that we're presenting up here. See this gap? They came in at what, 145, right? Or 140? And we said the research states this is more accurate. So then we gave them three options. 160 with everything remaining the same. 155 with more on this and more on this. 150, but then more on this and even more on that. Then they came back with this. 155, 590 RSUs. So they went from 190 to 222,000. And he took the one that had more RSUs. And that was wise, I think, in this case. Look at this. I was able to convert 190K base and 190K stocks to 220 base and 300 stocks. They literally gave him 30, what? Is that 30,000, 32,000, whatever that math is? And 120,000 more in stocks. This guy got 155K increase by just doing the Chinese menu philosophy. Ask yourself this. Why is it that the company didn't just offer him 155 more when he started? If they could do this much, then why didn't they just offer that to him? Because companies will always come in low. They expect you to negotiate. Don't ever think for a minute, if I negotiate, they're going to rescind the offer. The only time that will ever happen is if your ask is so ridiculous that they can't, they think that there's no way they can even make that up, that you're not even going to accept their offer. That's the only time it can ever get re rescinded. Otherwise, they're expecting you to offer. This is why we say intelligently negotiating. You want to look at market comp, look at data, and make sure what you're asking for is, is comparable. So this is the script. And this is what led them to get these things. And this is how they all got way more than what they negotiated for. We were targeting 125 to 135. Then she got 55 more. Look at this person. This person got to choose between two different options. This person, actually, um, Miriam knows her. Ended up going, she was making 15 bucks an hour, like five years prior to us working together. I think it was five. Yeah, five years. Right. Where did she say that? I mean, five years ago, I was getting paid 15 an hour. And then she kept doing this over and over and over again. And then she was able to get close to 200K. That's it. This is how you're going to land a high paying job offer in 2024. Clarity on what you want to do and why. Marketing yourself correctly and speaking only to the one role you're targeting. Spending 85% of your time or more reaching out directly to executives, hiring managers, senior leaders, people that can get you in front of those types of people rather than spending all your time applying. And then once you get the interview, you want to be extremely consultative about it. You want to create dialogue. You want to ask them about pain points. You want to position yourself as a solution to those pain points. And then once you finally get an offer, you want to negotiate intelligently. And I always, people, you know, I think like the number one thing when we do this is like people are like, man, this is hard. Will this be hard? And I, I just want to understand, well, why don't you first define what hard is? Because I think hard is spending all of your time applying and barely moving the needle. Katie, who you guys know, I work with, Katie says all the time, she's like, I believe hell. This might be extreme. She says, I believe hell is standing, is spending eternity staring at the person you could have been. That's hard. I think it's hard waking up every single day going to a job that you hate knowing that you're not making as much as you can, knowing there's other people who are less qualified making more. I think those things are hard. I think if I have to spend 70 days, 90 days doing all of these steps that we kind of walk through, but it allows me to get a position at a company I love doing what I enjoy, you know, making what I'm worth or more, then it's totally worth it. So I don't know how to define hard. But what I do know is, and this is one of my favorite quotes, I have it all over my house, is that all change is hard at first.
and then it's messy in the middle, and then it's beautiful at the end. So if you're going to try this, stick with it, because you'll find that you're a lot closer than you think. I know it because I've done it myself. I know it because we've done it for 800 other people. Um, Because I know you guys will ask, I always get asked this, you know, how do we work or whatever? This is like, I think as of this morning, Katie told me, like, don't offer a bunch of seats in the program. We we don't because we only like just so you know, we only work with 15 people at a time in our program. And I think as of this morning, Katie told me we only have two. So if you're interested in learning about how to put all this together, then you can always book a call. Uh, it's free. Um, and that's it. If If we can work together, great. If we can't, no worries. And nonetheless, all of you will still get the recording to this. All of you will still get that free guide. Um, it will, if you don't get it tomorrow, it'll come for sure over the weekend. So don't worry if you don't get it tomorrow, okay? Um, and then if you are interested in working with us to learn how to apply all this stuff, you can always use this link to book a call and I'll, I'll copy and paste it in the chat in a second. Um, but now we can open it up for Q&A.